CNN finally gave Elizabeth Warren her own town hall, and I think it was long overdue, and overall, she did a really good job in my opinion. You can tell that she was having a lot of fun with it. I think that she came across as a really personable candidate. This wasn't necessarily the I'm gonna crack open a beer Elizabeth Warren that we saw on Instagram when she first launched. I think you kind of saw her embrace the inner wonk and nerd that she actually is and that's great because that's what we love about Elizabeth Warren. Be yourself. Don't try to be Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Don't even try to be Bernie. Just be yourself and tell us about your policy ideas. And for the most part, I think that she did that really well. And this is probably the first CNN town hall where I'm not going to complain about the questions that were asked because for the most part, almost all of them were very substantive, which is great. It's a breath of fresh air because when you tune into CNN, you expect mostly idiotic questions. But I mean, for the most part, they were great. I think that they curated a list of questions that were fair, um, but still tough. So by and large, I think that she did a great job, and I'm tempted to give her a high grade. However, she answered so poorly on one particular question that it not just harmed my perspective or impacted my perspective about the town hall overall, it actually literally brought her down in my book as a candidate. And that is a question about Medicare for all. It's the one question where I I think it was clear she completely bombed. And I'm going to show you a clip now of an individual that talked about Medicare for all. And he framed his question in a way of, I support it, but I'm worried about the fact that unions are kind of against it because people like their current health insurance. And if you're someone who actually supports Medicare for all, what you want to do in these instances is educate them. This is what Bernie Sanders did at his town hall. Bernie Sanders explained that people don't necessarily like their insurance, rather they like their doctor. So really the only difference with Medicare for All and the current for-profit system is that instead of having a Blue Cross Blue Shield card, you'd have a Medicare card. So we're really at a point in time where when we have the public behind a certain policy, Medicare for All, now progressive leaders need to be educating people, giving them the details. But Elizabeth Warren did not do that. She talked about everything with regard to healthcare, but Medicare for all. So this is her answer. And then when we come back, I'm going to tell you why I was so disappointed. But don't worry, we will get to her other answers. So we'll end on a positive note. But I just want to get this out of the way because I think it's really important. Healthcare is a basic human right, and we fight for basic human rights. And then. Let's put these in order, because I appreciate that your question starts with the Affordable Care Act. Let's all remember, when we're talking about what's possible, let's start where we are and the difference between Democrats and Republicans. Right now, Democrats are trying to figure out how to expand health care coverage at the lowest possible cost so everybody is covered. Republicans, right this minute, are out there trying to repeal the Affordable Care Act. They've got a lawsuit pending down in Texas where they're trying to roll it back, what they couldn't do with a vote. They're trying to do with the courts. HHS every day is doing what they can to undermine the Affordable Care Act. So when we're talking about health care in America right now, the first thing we need to be talking about is defend the Affordable Care Act, protection under the Affordable Care Act, part two. Let's make the improvements that are what I think of as the low-hanging fruit. For example, let's bring down the cost of prescription drugs all across this country. And then you know what you're going to hear from a consumer advocate. And that is we need to hold insurance companies accountable. And that means no tripping and trapping people on those insurance contracts. And then when we talk about Medicare for all, there are a lot of different pathways. What we're all looking for is the lowest cost way to make sure everybody gets covered. And some folks are talking about, let's start lowering the age. Maybe bring it down to 60, 55, 50. That helps cover people who are most at risk and can be helpful, for example, to the labor's plans. Some people say, do it the other way. Let's bring it up from uh, everybody under 30 gets covered by Medicare. Others say, let employers be able to buy into the Medicare plans. Others say, let's let employees buy into the Medicare plans. For me, what's key 
is we get everybody at the table on this, that labor's at the table, that people who have to buy on their own, everybody comes to the table together, and we figure out how to do Medicare for all in a way that makes sure that we're going to get 100% coverage in this country at the lowest possible cost for everyone. That's our job. First of all, she started by saying health care is a right. This is a term that was important at first, but now it's meaningless because even corporate Democrats like John Delaney contend that health care is a right. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it should be a right in the sense that it's free at the point of delivery, which means they don't actually believe it's a right. But what this tells me is that corporate Democrats have co-opted the language that progressives use when pitching Medicare for all. So that doesn't say anything. So saying health care is a right, not important anymore. She then pivoted to how bad Republicans are and said, look, Democrats want to expand health care. Republicans want to chip away at it. And that's true, but you should be explaining Medicare for all specifically. She said, we've got to start by defending the Affordable Care Act, and then we've got to bring down the price of prescription drugs, and then we've got to hold insurance companies accountable. And then finally, towards Towards the end, she got to Medicare for All, and she says, when we talk about Medicare for All, there are lots of different pathways. What we're all looking for is the lowest cost way to make sure everybody gets covered. And then she talks about lowering the age of Medicare, and then a public option where you can buy into Medicare. And it's just evident that she was tap dancing around Medicare for All itself. And then she said, we need to get people together, quote, and figure out how to do Medicare for all in a way that makes sure that we're going to get 100% coverage in this country at the lowest possible cost for everyone. Well, hey, Liz, I've got news for you. You just answered your own question. It's Medicare for all. So if you say Medicare for all and you're still wondering how we get to lower cost coverage and 100% of people covered, then something seriously disingenuous is happening there. Because if you want to get to 100% coverage, you just pass Medicare for all. It really is that simple. Now, crafting the policy details itself is complex, but it is the one solution. That is not just something that's politically savvy because it's overwhelmingly popular, but from a policy standpoint, it's just a good policy. It's what all the other modern industrialized nations have, and it's what we should move towards. But she didn't say that. Now, I'm going to show you a follow-up where Jake Tapper said, well, look, you've co-sponsored Bernie Sanders' Medicare for All bill. Does that mean you support abolishing private health insurance companies? Now, I have an issue with the way he framed that question because this talk of abolishing private health care companies is a bit disingenuous because Bernie's bill and Pramila Jayapal's bill does not just outright say we're going to abolish private health insurance companies. It just kind of makes them outdated and unnecessary if you have Medicare for all. But nonetheless, I'm not playing you this clip so you can see Jake Tapper basically talk about Medicare for all in a really ignorant way. I'm playing it for you because I want you to pay attention to how fast Elizabeth Warren runs away from the fact that she co-sponsored Bernie Sanders' Medicare for All bill. So you are a co-sponsor of Senator Bernie yep. Sanders' Medicare for, for All bill. And I understand there are a lot of different paths to universal coverage, but, yep. but his bill that you've co-sponsored would essentially eliminate private insurance. Is that something you could support? He's got to run away for that. I think we get everybody together and that's what it is, we'll decide. Um, I've also co-sponsored other bills, including expanding Medicaid is another approach that we use. But what's really important to me about this is we never lose sight of what the center is, because the center is about making sure that every single person in this country gets the coverage they need and that it's at a price that they can afford. We start with our values, we'll get to the right place. Ask yourself this question. Does that look to you like someone who's going to fight for Medicare for all if she gets elected? It was almost as if she was embarrassed to admit that she co-sponsored Bernie Sanders' Medicare for All bill. Oh, well, I didn't just co-sponsor that bill. I co-sponsored these other bills, too. Public option, lowering the age of uh, Medicare. I don't understand why she would do this. But it communicates to me very clearly that she does not support Medicare for All and she absolutely wouldn't fight for it. Because at this stage... When you already have the public behind you, if you actually support Medicare for All, then you're moving on to the details. You're now trying to educate people about it before you actually implement it. She's not doing that. 
She's talking about other issues. So, I mean, this was absolutely, it felt like a gut punch to see her talk about it this way. Because I already told you that she's kind of giving us indications that she's backing away from Medicare for All, but she still had enough room for plausible deniability. But here, with this long-winded answer where she wouldn't firmly commit to it, it's evident she just doesn't support it. She may support it in a roundabout way. It may be a long-term goal, but within the next four to eight years in the event she's elected, would she fight for it? I think it's clear she would not. So I was thoroughly unimpressed. It affected the way I feel about her as a candidate. She went down substantially in my book. I mean, Medicare for All is the bare minimum. It's the easiest litmus test to pass if you actually are progressive. Do you think people should not die or go bankrupt if they can't afford health insurance? If the answer is yes, then the only solution is making healthcare free at the point of service. That's what Medicare for All does, and it's already a compromise because the ideal system would be a national health system like the UK has. So we're already compromising, but you can't even commit to something that's just standard for American progressivism, and that is now supported among the overwhelming majority of Americans. It's just unforgivable. But I don't want to give you the impression that this entire town hall was awful because of that answer, because really that was the outlier because everything else was pretty good. So she was asked a question about essentially reparations. The person who posed the question to her didn't say the words reparations. She asked what her administration would do to apologize to to apologize for 400 years of slavery. And I was actually really impressed here with Elizabeth Warren's answer. America was founded on principles of liberty and freedom and on the backs of slave labor. This is a stain on America. And we're not going to fix that. We're not going to change that until we address it head on directly. And make no mistake, it's not just the original founding. It's what's happened generation after generation. The impact of discrimination handed down from one to the next means that today in America, because of housing discrimination, because of employment discrimination, we live in a world where for the average white family has $100, the average black family has about $5. So I believe it's time to start the national full-blown conversation about reparations in this country. I support the bill in the House to appoint a congressional panel to, of experts, of people who are studying this, who talk about different ways we may be able to do it, and to make a report back to Congress so that we can, as a nation, do what's right and begin to heal. So she was asked a really broad question, and she chose to bring up reparations. And she also talked about pushing for H.R. 40. She talked about bringing people from the community together to decide what's the best approach here for reparations. And Jake Tapper asked whether or not she supports writing a check, and she didn't explicitly endorse this. Um, no candidate has thus far, but I do think that her answer about bringing people together, it was comprehensive and it was impressive. It showed that she really is listening and she's astute here, at least minimally. So I personally was impressed here. And then the issue of voting rights came up and she touched on a topic within the discussion of voting rights that no candidate ever talks about. And it was another area where I was absolutely impressed with her answer. I believe we need a constitutional amendment that protects the right to vote for every American citizen and to make sure that vote gets counted. We need to put some federal muscle behind that. And we need to repeal every one of the voter suppression laws that is out there right now. And I'll tell you one more. We need to make sure that every vote counts. And, and I, I, wanna, I wanna push that right here in Mississippi because I think this is an important point. You know, come a general election, presidential candidates don't come to places like Mississippi. Yeah. They also don't come to places like California and Massachusetts, right? Because we're not the battleground states. Well, my view is that every vote matters. And the way we can make that happen is that we can have 
national voting, and that means get rid of the electoral college <laughs> and everybody can. That right there, in my opinion, is exactly how you answer a question about voting rights, because it's not just like you have to repeal all of these voter ID laws and laws that disenfranchise voters. And, you know, it's not just about reenfranchising voters. It's making sure that our democracy as a whole is more equitable. And so long as we have this outdated racist institution known as the Electoral College in place, we can't have that. So she talked about abolishing the Electoral College and the crowd went nuts. That was probably one of the moments where they applauded her the loudest and the strongest because they were so excited. And I'm especially glad to see her come out and take this position after another progressive presidential candidate, Andrew Yang, came out and said, I don't support abolishing the Electoral College. And I can't see how that is something anyone could agree with because what Andrew Yang was saying is, look, I think that if we do that, then candidates are just going to campaign in densely populated uh, cities and they're going to avoid rural areas. But they should be campaigning where the people are. And what matters the most is that all of our votes are weighted equally. But somebody in California doesn't have as much voting power as someone in a swing state like Ohio. So that's completely unacceptable. So I don't even think that it's reasonable anymore to say I'm against abolishing the Electoral College. I think it's just the standard progressive position because if you honestly think we shouldn't, then you have to defend how twice in modern history we've had presidents who actually were able to assume office while getting less votes than their opponent. It's just an untenable position for someone who's progressive, and I'm really glad that she came out swinging here. Now, the last clip that I want to play for you is her plan to mitigate corruption. Um, she was initially asked what she'd do to make sure that the wealthy pay their fair share. And, um, you know, I think that she went into corruption and uh, her Accountable Capitalism Act. And overall, it wasn't a perfect answer, but for the most part... It was really great and uh, thorough. When you've got a government that works for the rich and it's not working nearly as well for anyone else, that's corruption. And we need to call it out plain and simple. So the first thing we need to do is we need to attack that corruption head on. I have the biggest anti-corruption bill since Watergate. Big problem, you gotta have a big bill to deal with it. Now, it's got a lot of pieces to it, but the main point is to beat back on the influence of money because that's how they keep getting this government, getting this country to work for them. So, for example, my bill says we're going to end lobbying as we know it. Yeah. Block the revolving door between Main Street, uh, between Wall Street and Washington. Uh, that, I'll give you one more. Everyone who runs for federal office ought to have to put their taxes online. We got to deal with the corruption head on, but let me give you a part two. I was talking earlier about we got to rewrite the rules in this economy. And part of that is putting more power back in the hands of workers. Unions, that's one way to do it. I've got an accountable capitalism bill that says on the big Fortune 500 companies that we're going to have employees also sit on the board of directors and help make decisions. <laughs> but there's one more we've got to talk about, and that is my ultra-millionaires tax. So the idea is on the truly great fortunes, $50 million and above, we start charging 2% a year on just that 50 millionth and first dollar and on up. 2% a year. By the way, anybody in here a homeowner? You've been paying wealth taxes for a long time. They're just called property taxes. I, I just want to include the Rembrandt and the diamonds in the property taxes. <laughs> so I want to put a wealth tax in place and I just want to talk to you for one minute about how that restructures our whole economy. We get a 2% tax on the 75,000 richest families in this country. We would have enough money 
to provide universal child care, universal pre-K, universal pre-pre-K for every child in America and still have $2 trillion left over. Let's make it happen. So I liked her response there because it was long, but unlike her answer on Medicare for All, this was actually substantive. Now, it's not perfect because my perfect answer to the issue of corruption would be a constitutional amendment where we just get money out of politics, we ban super PACs, and we publicly finance every single election. That's my ideal situation, but nonetheless, what she's talking about here it really wouldn't make a difference. She talked about her anti-corruption bill that would end lobbying as we know it. I need to know more details, but I like it. Just, you know, by default, she talked about locking the revolving door between Main Street and Washington. She talked about how everyone who runs for federal office will be mandated to release their tax returns. I mean, I think that this is all just standard and it's common sense. And then she talked about her Accountable Capitalism Act. And what I liked is that she brought up her wealth tax, but she compared it to a property tax and explained how we kind of already have a wealth tax on homeowners. It's just that we call it property taxes and not a wealth tax. And she didn't just talk about the amount of revenue that that would bring in, but she gave us some examples as to what we could do with that revenue. And I think that's exactly how you've got to answer these questions. You don't make it just about forcing the rich to pay their fair share, but you make it about giving Americans what's owed to them. So by and large, to kind of just take a step back, I think she did a good job. She answered most questions in a way that ranges from adequate to excellent, but I just, I really am stuck on her answer when it comes to Medicare for All. It was so atrocious. I didn't expect her to give that bad of an answer. Um, and I know that people will call me alarmist and say that I'm being hyperbolic and I'm trying to, you know, not interpret her answer in a way that's charitable or should be interpreted. But look, you've got to understand that if somebody's not saying why we need Medicare for all, then they're not in favor of Medicare for all. Because if you say, well, there's many paths to Medicare for all, essentially what you're arguing for is a stepping stone in between Medicare for all and our current system, which is unnecessary. You don't need a stepping stone. There's no law that mandates a stepping stone <laughs> between, um, you know, what we have now, our shitty system and Medicare for all. You could just pass Medicare for all and have it be the law. But overall, I don't want to give you the impression that this was bad. I think she did a good job. It's just that that answer was bad on Medicare for all. But um, it was it was a good town hall. I would encourage people to watch the entire thing. But um, overall, I think that it's clear she has some really innovative ideas and you can see that she's trying to be more authentic and I think that it's working for her. She's more personable. She's not trying to be as focus group driven as she previously seemed at the beginning of her campaign. And, you know, by and large, I think this was a good town hall and it was more heavy on the substance than I would have expected, which is good. Girly Mike Fettuccini needs your support on Patreon. What a loser. Visit patreon.com slash humanist report to support the low ratings humanist report. Sad. My views are much higher. <laughs>